Would you take your copy of God's Word and turn to Matthew's Gospel this morning, chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. You've heard a lot of great information this morning. And really, it, uh, it sets the table for us exactly right. We're entering into a building campaign which will require sacrifice, but at the same time, we're still going, we're still praying, we're still sending people around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've closed the book on Lottie Moon after, Jan after December and January. You know what you did for international missions? Just a few dollars short of $270,000 went to international missions. That's money that's gone. It, it will not be a part of what we do here. But it's our commitment to making a difference in the world. So thank you for that. Watching the, uh, the girls up here, I was mindful of something Reinhold Niebuhr once said. The final proof that man no longer knows God is that he does not know his own sin. The sinner who justifies himself does not know God as judge and does not need God as Savior. If you deny your sinfulness, there's really no place for God in your life. You have to start there. Chapter 19, beginning at verse 16, and you'll recognize this story immediately. It's the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, it's told in three different Gospels, and, and we never get the whole picture in any one of them. It's only when we put them all together that we know that he was rich that he was a ruler, and that he was young. Chapter 19, verse 16. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked him, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter eternal life, then obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then... Come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. In the future, when you look back upon your life, let's say 20 years out from now, when you look back on your life, what will be your biggest regret? Will there be anything that you are sorry for? We tend to think that uh, when we look back upon our lives, it'll be something we did that we regret. Mark Twain said, no, in 20 years, as you look back, it will more likely be something you did not do. What might have been had you possessed a little more courage or a little more faith? I like everything about this man that I know. I mean, how, how much more likable can you be? He seems to have it all. He's wealthy, he's powerful, and he's got youth. You'd want to bring him home for your daughter to meet. He'd be the perfect catch. And let's throw in good-looking, too. The text doesn't say that, but why not? If he's, if he's rich and powerful and young, he's got to be good-looking, too. In a way, he was like the country he grew up in. Everything came too easily to him. He's moving through life. He's got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow. He, he has everything he needs. And yet we see him here coming to Jesus. We meet him as the rich young ruler, but one day he's going to be the rich old ruler. And when he looks back, what will he think about? Well, he, he, might not, uh, he might not be in power, you know. There was that election in 2024, and it was an anti-incumbent mood in the country, and he got voted out. Andrew Young once said, it's quite an experience to one day be in the motorcade going down Pennsylvania Avenue, and then one day later, you're on the street looking at somebody else in the motorcade going down the street. 
And maybe he won't be rich in the future. Maybe in the great stock market crash of 2029, he loses his shirt. And those were the things so important to him, power and money, and maybe by then he's lost them all. What will he regret? Here's what I think. This man will regret one moment in his life, one day. It happened so quickly. But in that moment, he made a decision that changed everything. So look at his story here. The first thing I see is that he was looking for something that day. He was looking for something. Do you know what it was? He comes to Jesus and he said, Teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? He didn't have that. He had everything else. But this is what's on his mind. What do I have to do to get eternal life? Now, there's a difference between eternal life and everlasting life. They're almost the same, but not quite. Everlasting life is living forever, and it's included in the question. But eternal life means more. It means a life of meaning and purpose, a life of joy, something that touches him deep down in his soul. Everything comes easily to this guy. But about once a month, he begins to fear that he is a fraud because something's not right. I think everybody's asking that question. They may not phrase it that way. They don't know how to phrase it that way. But that's really what everybody wants. Whether you've got a little or you've got a lot, you want eternal life. When Moses is making his last uh, sermon to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he's soon going to die, and uh, Joshua is going to take them on in. But he preaches to them one more time, and he says, Here today I am setting before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. Scott Black Johnston, a Presbyterian preacher, was talking about this text recently, and he came to that sentence, Choose life, and the pastor wondered, well, who wouldn't? Does that even need to be said? Who would choose death when you can have life? But people do it all the time. Thousands of people each year in our country take their life in suicide. And what a tragedy. In every city in America, large and small, and even in rural communities, there's violence where somebody takes a gun and takes a life. They're choosing death. Women have the inalienable right now in this country to take the life of an unborn child. They're choosing death instead of life. And then there's ISIS and Boko Haram. They choose death every day. How about you? Are you choosing life? Full, meaningful, eternal life. Did you choose it this morning when you woke up? Did, did you say to yourself, today... I choose to live life to the fullest with God in my life. He's looking for eternal life. And he comes to the right person, and he comes in the right way. Mark's gospel, when it tells the story, says that he comes running. He understands that this is the most important thing of all. This is urgent. And Mark tells us that he comes running and kneeling he doesn't understand totally who Jesus is, but he knows he's different. And he humbles himself by getting on his knees. That's how you have to come to God, too. You, you can't come in arrogance and pride. You've got to humble yourself. And he comes to the right person. He comes to Jesus. Everybody's looking for eternal life, meaningful life today, but they're going in so many different directions. They're going to this teacher and that philosophy and this possession they're going to the wrong places. This man, to his credit, went to the right man. He went straight to Jesus. He was more right than he knew. On one occasion, John chapter 6, the crowd, uh, upon hearing the demands of discipleship, they walk away, and Jesus looks at those that remain, and he, he asks them, are you going to leave me too? And one of them said, no, Lord, to whom would we go? Who but you has the word of eternal life? And nobody does. So this young man comes to Jesus with his question. Now, Jesus is going to answer him. But for it to really happen for this young man, he's going to have to change his mind about some things. 
That's hard for folks to do. It's hard for me. It's hard, harder the older I get, maybe for you too. But the word repentance in the Bible is the word metanoia, and it means to change your mind. And before you can have eternal life, you've got to change your mind about some things. The first thing he has to change his mind about is the question he asked. Look at it again. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? Well, he's wrong right there. You don't do anything to get eternal life. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished as he was dying, meaning I have completed the transaction. I have paid the full price. Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. He says in Mark's account of this story, he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him a, a strange answer. He said to him, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that is God. Is he saying that he wasn't good? Of course not. Jesus is God. The problem is this young man is coming to Jesus as but a teacher, a superior teacher, wise beyond his years, but still merely a man. And so Jesus is saying to him, if this is all you think I am, then don't call me good, because none is good but God only. In this account, look at it, it's phrased differently. Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. This young man doesn't think there's any evil in his heart. He thinks he's good enough. He can't find God until he recognizes his own sinfulness. And till this point, he's not able to do that. Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, then obey the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, that is, don't lie, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now look at his answer. All these I have kept, and in another gospel he says, all these I have kept from my youth. Really? Seriously? This young man says, I've kept all these? all my life? Of course he hadn't. Murder, for example. Well, maybe he had never taken a gun or a knife and taken an innocent human life, but you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you're angry with your brother, you've committed murder already in your heart. And adultery, well, he hadn't done that. But the, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you've looked lustfully upon somebody, you've committed adultery already in your heart. And he's never told a lie to anybody. He's never taken anything that didn't belong to him. Jesus lets it go. I don't know why he lets it go. Jesus just lets him go with that. I don't think I would. I, I think I'd call him on it. James, in chapter 2 of that epistle, said that if you keep the whole law of God, let's say he kept 99% uh, of, the, of these things, if you keep all the law and yet you offend in one point, you are guilty of all. That's pretty tough talk. You, 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 you sin one time in your whole life and you are a sinner. That's why Paul would say in Romans 3, for all have sinned. He's not saying you're as bad as you could be. You could be a lot worse, so could I. But if we've ever done one thing wrong, we are sinners. Why is he even talking to Jesus if he feels so good about himself? I think deep in his heart, though he won't admit it, he knows something is missing. And he's got to change his mind about who Jesus is and what sin is and his own condition if he's ever to find life. And then Jesus gives him the answer. The young man says, well, what do I lack? What one thing do I lack? And Jesus looked at him and said, if you want to be perfect, this is in verse 21, go sell your possessions and give to the poor 
and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. What's Jesus doing? He's demanding that this young man totally divest himself of all his wealth, all his possessions, in one fell swoop, just get rid of it all, sell it all, and give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. It's amazing. Jesus sees something we don't see yet. We're going to see it in just a minute, but Jesus saw it ahead of time. And that's why he tells the young man what he must do. I don't know that he would say it to you in exactly those terms. He says it to this young man because he knows that for that rich young ruler, money is his God. Money is around which his life revolves. Money's everything. And what Jesus is saying, you can't have two gods. You can't serve God and mammon, God and wealth. You, you can only have one. And so if you're going to follow me, you've got to let go. You've got to let go of all of that. Now, he might not say it exactly like that to you, but it's the same point. Whatever your God is, and it may well be money, whatever it is, you've got to let it go. Somebody observed, you know, we have in God we trust on our money, and we trust God the least with our money than with anything else we have. We just can't trust him. Because this is money. This is real life. We can't step out on faith and do something big with money because we, we trust in money and not in God. What was he asking you to give up? To follow Jesus completely. Now, honestly, and this is me. I don't know if it's you or not, but every time I read the story, I feel sorry for the guy. Because it seems like Jesus is asking an awful lot. Even if he wouldn't ask it of me, I feel bad that he's asking it of that guy. I mean, on the spot, instantly, all he's known is wealth and privilege, and you want him to give it up? It seems so unreasonable. Mark Batterson said that maybe we should look at what Jesus is putting on the table. Instead of considering what the young man's got to give up, why don't we see what Jesus is offering in its place? This is a city where thousands of people come everywhere every, every year looking for internships. Maybe you're here for that reason. An internship on Capitol Hill. You're not making any money, but your resume is getting better by the day. And you're learning things, and it's going to pave the way for a brighter future for you. People fight for those internships. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's offering this rich, young ruler the best internship of all. Imagine to be able to walk with Jesus every day, to see how he thinks, to hear his words straight from his lips, to watch him as he feeds thousands with a little boy's lunch, to see him as he touches a sick body and the person gets well, to watch him when he's standing outside of a cemetery and calling forth the dead and they get up filled with life. Imagine what he's being offered. And he offers you the same thing. Not just to save your soul and take you to heaven when you die, but eternal life begins right now. It begins today when you give your life to Christ and you enter into that relationship where you follow him and you get this life and then you do get the life to come with him forever. And look at what happens. This is where we get to see what Jesus already saw. The Bible says the man went away sad because he had great wealth there it is there was his god he went away sad i think the question hung in the air for a while i don't think it was a quick answer i think he's, he stood there for a few moments and was thinking back and forth what should i do he was at a crossroads in his life he was at the fork of the road if i go this way i can't go that way if i go that way i can't go the other and he finally made his choice. Because he had great possessions, he went away sad. I think that's the decision he regretted the rest of his life and regrets to this moment that he did not give his life to Christ that day. 
would have changed everything. He might have lost his wealth. He might have been voted out of office. He might have lost his good looks with age. But he would have had life abundant and full. And that's what Jesus offers you, the same deal. Give everything you are to me, he says. Let go of every God you have and come and follow me. And if you do, you'll never regret that. 